Hey everybody, Chief here. Just a quick note before we get started. Thank you for all the love and support the last couple weeks between notes about how you're enjoying the content to all the get well soons and such. I very much appreciate it. Um, I've been sick for about three and a half weeks. I'm finally over it. I still don't know what it was, but I'm feeling a hell of a lot better. So thank you very much. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Thank you for being here. With that being said, <clears throat> Chapter 40 Lights blazed throughout the homestead. Gladers ran about, everyone talking at once. A couple of boys cried in a corner. Chaos ruled. Thomas ignored all of it. He ran into the hallway, then, lean, then leaped down the stairs three at a time. He pushed his way through a crowd in the foyer, tore out of the homestead and towards the west door, sprinting. He pulled up just short of the threshold of the maze, his instincts forcing him to think twice about entering. Newt called to him from behind, delaying the decision. Minho followed it out there, Thomas yelled when Newt caught up to him. A small towel pressed against the wound on his head. A patchy spot of blood had already seeped through the white material. I saw, Newt said, pulling the towel away to look at it. He grimaced and put it back. Shuck it, that hurts like a mother. Minnow must have finally fried the last little bit of front brain cells, not to mention Galley. Always knew he was crazy. Thomas could only worry about Minnow. I'm going after him. Time to be a bloody hero again? Thomas looked at Newt sharply, hurt by the rebuke. You think I do things to impress you, Shanks? Please. All I care about is getting out of here. Yeah, well, you're a regular toughie. But right now, we've got worse problems. What? Thomas knew if he wanted to catch up with Minho, he had no time for this. Somebody, Newt began. There he is, Thomas shouted. Minho just turned a corner up ahead when and was coming straight for them. Thomas cupped his hands. What are you, wa what are you doing, idiot? Minho waited until he made it back through the door, then bent down on hands and knees, sucked in a few breaths before answering. I just wanted to make sure... Make sure of what? Newt asked. A lot of good you'd be, taken with Galley. Minnow straightened and put his hands on his hips, still breathing heavily. Slim it, boys. I just wanted to see if they went toward the cliff, toward the griever hole. And? Thomas said. Bingo. Minnow wiped the sweat from his forehead. I just can't believe it, Newt said, almost whispering. What a night. Thomas's thoughts tried to drift toward the hole and what it all meant, but he couldn't shake the thought of what Newt had been about to say before they saw Minho return. What were you about to tell me? he asked. You said we had worse. Yeah. Newt pointed over pointed his thumb over his shoulder. You can still see the bug and smoke. Thomas looked in that direction. The heavy metal door of the map room was slightly ajar, a wispy trail of black smoke drifting out of the gray sky. Somebody burned the map trunks, Newt said. Every last one of them. For some reason, Thomas didn't care about the maps that much. They seemed pointless anyway. He stood outside the window of the slammer, having left Newt and Minho when, when they went to investigate the sabotage of the min map room. Thomas had noticed them exchange an odd look before the, they split up, almost, almost as if communicating some secret with their eyes. But Thomas could think of only one thing. <clears throat> Teresa? he asked. Her face appeared, hands rubbing her eyes. Was anybody killed? She asked, somewhat groggy. Were you sleeping? Thomas asked. He was relieved to see that she appeared okay, felt him relax. Excuse me, felt himself relax. I was, she responded, until I heard something shred the homestead to bits. What happened? Thomas shook his head in disbelief. I don't know how you could have slept through all the noise the grievers made out there. You try coming out of a coma sometime, see how you do. Now, answer my question, she said inside his head. Thomas blinked, momentarily surprised by the voice since she hadn't done it in a while. Cut that junk out. Just tell me what happened. Thomas sighed. It was such a long story and he didn't feel like telling the whole thing. You don't know Galley, but he's a psycho kid who ran away. He showed up, jumped on a griever, and all, they all took off into the maze. It was really weird. He still couldn't believe it actually happened. Which is saying a lot, Teresa said. Yeah. He looked behind him, hoping to see Albie somewhere. Surely he'd let Teresa out now. 
Gladers were scattered all over the complex, but there was no sign of their leader. He turned back to Teresa. I just don't get it. Why would the Grievers have left after getting Galley? He said something about them killing us one a night until we're all dead. He said it at least twice. Teresa put her hands through the bars, rested her forearms against the concrete sill. Just one night. Excuse me, just one a night. Why? <clears throat> I don't know. He also said it had to do with trials or variables, something like that. Thomas had the strange urge he'd had the night before to reach out and take one of her hands. He stopped himself, though. Tom, I was thinking about what you told me I said, that the maze is a code. Being holed up in here does wonders for making the brain do what it's made for. What do you think it means? Intensely interested, he tried to block out the shouts and clatter and chatter rumbling through the glade as others found out the map room had been burned. Well, the walls move every day, right? Yeah. He could tell she was really onto something. And Minho said they think there's a pattern, right? Right. Gear started starting to shift into place inside Thomas's head as well, almost as if a prior memory was beginning to break loose. Well, I can't remember why I said that to you about the code. I know when I was coming out of the coma, all sorts of thoughts and memories swirled through my head like crazy, almost as if I could feel someone emptying my mind, sucking them out. And I felt like I needed to say that thing about the code before I lost it, so there must be an important reason. Thomas almost didn't hear her. He was thinking harder about than he had in a while. They always compare each section's map to the one from the day before, and the day before that, and the day before that, day by day, each runner just analyzing their own section. What if they're supposed to compare the maps to other sections? He trailed off, feeling like he was on the cusp of something. <laughs> Teresa seemed to ignore him, doing her own theorizing. The first thing... The first thing the word code makes me think is of is letters. Letters in the alphabet. Maybe the maze is trying to spell something. Everything came together so quickly in Thomas's mind he almost heard an audible click, as if the pieces all snapped into place at once. You're right. You're right. But the runners have been looking at it all, all wrong this whole time. They've been analyzing it the wrong way. Teresa gripped the bars now, her knuckles white. Her face pressed against the iron rods. What? What are you talking about? Thomas grabbed the two bars outside of where she held on, moving close enough to smell her. A surprisingly pleasant scent of sweat and flowers. Minho said the patterns repeat themselves, only they can figure out what it means. But they've always studied them section by section, comparing one day to the next. What if each day of the separate piece of the code and they're supposed to use all eight sections together somehow. You think maybe each day is trying to reveal a word? Teresa asked. With the wall... Whoops. With the wall movements? Thomas nodded. Or maybe a, le a letter a day. I don't know. But they've always thought the movements would reveal how to escape, not to spell something. They've been studying it like a map. Not like a picture of something. We've got a... Then he stopped, remembering what he had just been told by Newt. Oh, no. Teresa's eyes flared with worry. What's wrong? Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. Thomas let go of the bars and stumbled back a step as the realization hit him. He turned to look at the map room. The smoke had lessened, but it was still wafted out the door, a dark, hazy cloud covering the entire area. What's wrong? Teresa repeated. She couldn't see the map room from her angle. Thomas faced her again. I didn't think it mattered. What? she demanded. Someone burned all the maps. If there was a code, it's gone. Chapter 41 I'll be back, Thomas said, turning to go. His stomach was full of acid. I gotta find Newt, see if any of the maps survived. Wait, Teresa yelled. Get me out of here. But there was no time, and Thomas felt awful about it. I can't. I'll be back, I promise. He turned before she could protest and set off at a sprint for the map room in his foggy black cloud of smoke. Needles of pain pricked his insides. If Teresa was right and they had been that close to figuring out some kind of clue to get out of here, only to see it literally lost in flames, 
It was so upsetting it hurt. The first thing Thomas saw when he ran up was a group of gladers huddled just outside the large steel door, still ajar, its outer edge blackened with soot. But as he got closer, he realized there were surrounding something on the ground, all of them looking down at it. He spotted Newt kneeling there in the middle, look, leaning over a body. Minho was standing behind him, looking distraught and dirty, and spotted Thomas first. Where'd you go? he asked. To talk to Teresa. What happened? He waited anxiously for the next dump of bad news. Minho's forehead creased with anger. Our map room was set on fire and you ran off to talk to your shuck girlfriend? What is wrong with you? Thomas knew the rebukes should have stung, but his mind was too preoccupied. I didn't think it mattered anymore. If you haven't figured out the maps by now... Minho looked disgusted, the pale light of, and the fog of smoke making his face seem almost sinister. Yeah, this is a great freaking time to give up. What the... I'm sorry. Just tell me what happened. Thomas leaned over the shoulder of a skinny boy, standing in front of him to get a good look at the body on the ground. It was Alby. Flat on his back, a huge gash on his forehead. Blood seeped down from both sides of his head. Some into his eyes, crusting there. Newt was cleaning it with a wet rag, gingerly, asking questions in a whisper too low to hear. Thomas, concerned for Albies, despite his recent ill-tempered ways, turned back to Minho and repeated his question. Winston found him out here, half dead, the map room blazing. Some shanks got in there and put it out, but way too late. All the trunks had burned to a freaking crisp. I suspected Albie at first, but whoever did it slammed his shuck head against the table. You can see where. It's nasty. Who do you think did it? Thomas was hesitant to tell him about the possible discovery he and Teresa had made. With no maps, the point was moot. Maybe Galley before he showed up in the homestead and went psycho? Maybe the Grievers? I don't know. I don't care. Doesn't matter. Thomas was surprised at the sudden change of heart. Now who's the one giving up? Minho's sna head snapped up so quickly, Thomas took a step backward. There was a flash of anger there, but it quickly melted into an odd expression of surprise or confusion. That's not what I meant, Shank. Thomas narrowed his eyes in curiosity. What did... Just shut your hole for now. Minho put his fingers to his lips, his eyes darting around to see if anyone was looking at him. Just shut your hole. You'll find out soon enough. Thomas took a deep breath and thought. If he expected the other boys to be honest, he should be honest too. He decided to better share about the possible maze code, maps or no maps. Minho, I need you to tell n I need to tell you and Newt something, and we need to let Teresa out. She's probably starving and we could use her help. That stupid girl is the last thing I'm worried about. Thomas ignored the insult. Just give us a few minutes. We have an idea. Maybe it'll still work with if enough runners remember the maps. They seemed to get Minnow's full attention, but again, there was that str same strange look, as if Thomas m was missing something very obvious. An idea? What? Just come over to the slammer with me, you and Newt. Minho thought for a second. Newt! He called out. Yeah? Newt stood up, refolding his body, his bloody rag to find a clean spot. Thomas couldn't help noticing every inch was dr drenched in red. Minho pointed down at Albie. Let the Med Jacks take care of him. We need to talk. Newt gave him a questioning look, then handed over the rag to the closest glader. Go find Clint. Tell him we got worse problems than guys with bug and splinters. When the kid ran off to do as he was told, Newt stepped away from Albie. Talk about what? Minho just nodded at Thomas, but didn't say anything. Just come with me, Thomas said. Then he turned and headed for the slammer without waiting for a response. Let her out. Thomas stood by the door, the cell door, arms folded. Let her out, and then we'll talk. Trust me, you want to hear it. Newt was covered in so soot and dirt, his hair matted with sweat. He certainly didn't seem to be in a very good mood. Tommy, this is... Please, just open it. Let her out. Please. He wouldn't give up this time. <clears throat> Minho stood in front of the door with his hands on his hips. How can we trust her? He asked. Soon as she woke up, the whole place fell to bits. She even admitted she triggered something. 
Sorry. He's got a point, Newt said. Thomas gestured through the door at Teresa. We can trust her. Every time I've talked to her, it's something about trying to get out of here. She was sent here just like the rest of us. It's stupid to think she's responsible for any of this. Newt grunted. Then what the bloody shuck did she mean by saying she triggered something? Thomas shrugged, refusing to admit that Newt had a good point. There had to be an explanation. Who knows? Her mind was doing all kinds of weird stuff when she woke up. Maybe we all wanted... Maybe we all went through that in the box, talking gibberish before we came fully awake. Just let her out. Newton and Minho exchanged a long look. Come on, Thomas insisted. What's she going to do, run around and stab every glader to death? Come on. Minho sighed. Fine, just let the stupid girl out. I'm not stupid, Teresa shouted, her voice muffled by the walls. I can hear every word you morons are saying. Newt's eyes widened. Real sweet girl you picked up, Tommy. Just hurry, Thomas said. I'm sure we have a lot to do before the Grievers come back tonight, if they don't come back during the day. Newt grunted and stepped up to the slammer, pulling his keys out as he did so. A few clinks later, the door swung wide open. Come on. Teresa walked out of the small building, glowering at Newt as she passed him. She gave a just as unpleasant glance toward Minho, then stopped to stand right next to Thomas. Her arm brushed against his, tingles shot across his skin, and he felt mortally embarrassed. All right, talk, Minho said. What's so important? Thomas looked at Teresa, wondering how to say it. What? she said. You talk. They obviously think I'm a serial killer. Yeah, you look so dangerous, Thomas muttered, but he turned his attention to Newton Minho. Okay. When Teresa was first coming out of her deep sleep, she had memories flashing through her mind. She, um, he just barely stopped himself from saying she had said it inside his mind. She told me later that she remembers the maze as a code. That maybe instead of solving it to find a way out, is trying to send us a message. A code? Minho asked. How is it a code? Thomas shook his head, wishing he could answer. I don't know for sure. You're way more familiar with the maps than I am. But I have a theory. That's why I was hoping you guys would remember some of them. Minho glanced at Newt, his eyebrows raised in question. Newt nodded. What? Thomas asked, f fed up with, keeping them, with them keeping information from him. You guys keep acting like you have a secret. Minho rubbed his eyes with both hands and took a deep breath. We hid the maps, Thomas. At first, it didn't compute. Huh? Minho pointed out at the homestead. We hid the freaking maps in the weapons room, put dummies in their place, because of Albie's warning, because of the so-called ending your girlfriend triggered. Thomas was so excited to hear this news, he temporarily forgot how awful things had become. He remembered Minho acting suspicious the day before, saying he had a special assignment Thomas looked over at Newt, who nodded. They're all safe and sound, Minho said. Every last one of those suckers. So if you have a theory, get talking. Take me to them, Thomas said, itching to have a look. Okay, let's go. Chapter 42 Minho switched on the light, making Thomas squint for a second until his eyes got used to it. Menacing shadows clung to the boxes of weapons scattered across the table and floor, Blades and sticks and other nasty-looking devices seemed to wait there, ready to take on a life of their own and kill the first person stupid enough to come close. The dank, musty smell only added to the creepy feel of the room. There's a hidden storage closet back here, Minho explained, walking past some shelves into a dark corner. Only a couple of us know about it. Thomas heard the creak of an old wooden door, and then Minho was dragging a cardboard box across the floor. The scrape of it sounded like a knife on bone. I put each trunk's worth of it in his own box. Eight boxes total. They're all in here. Which one is this? Thomas asked. He knelt down next to it, eager to get started. Just open it and see. Each page is marked, remember? Thomas pulled on the crisscrossed lid flaps until they popped open. The maps for Section 2 lay in a messy heap. Thomas reached in and pulled out a stack. Okay. Okay, he said. The runners have 
Always compare these day to day, looking to see if there's a pattern that would somehow help us figure out a way to an exit. You even said you don't really know what we're looking for, but you kept studying them anyway, right? Minho nodded, arms folded. He looked as if someone were about to reveal the secret of immortal life. Well, Thomas continued, what if all the wall movements had nothing to do with a map or a maze or anything like that? What if it instead, the pattern spelled words? Some kind of clue that'll help us escape. Minho pointed at the maps in Thomas's hand, letting out a frustrated sigh. Dude, you have any idea how much we've studied these things? Don't you think we would have noticed if it were spelling out some freaking words? Maybe it's too hard to see with the naked eye, just comparing one day to the next. Or maybe you weren't supposed to compare one day to the next, but look at it one day at a time. Newt laughed. Tommy, I might not be the sharpest guy in the glade, but sounds like you're talking straight out of your butt to me. While he had been talking, Thomas's mind had been spinning even faster. The answer was within his grasp. He knew he was almost there. It was just so hard to put it into words. Okay, okay, he said, starting over. You've always had one runner assigned to one section, right? Right, Minho replied. He seemed genuinely interested and ready to understand. And that runner makes a map every day and then compares it to, to maps from previous days for that section. What if, instead, you're supposed to compare the eight sections to each other every day, each day being a separate clue or code? Did you ever compare sections to other sections? Minho rubbed his chin, nodding. Yeah, kind of. We tried to see if they made something when, they put, when put together. Of course we did that. We tried everything. Thomas pulled his legs up underneath him, studying the maps in his lap. He could just barely see the lines of the maze written on the second page through the page resting on top. In that instant, he knew what they had to do. He knew what they had to do. He looked up at the others. Wax paper? Huh? Minho asked. What the? Just trust me. We need wax paper and scissors. And every black marker and pencil you can find. Frypan wasn't too happy about having a whole box of wax paper rolls taken away from him, especially with their supplies being cut off. He argued that it was one of the things he always requested, that he always used it for baking. They finally had to tell him what they needed to convince him to give it up. After ten minutes of hunting pencils and markers, most had been in the map room where, and were discovered. I'm sorry. Most have been in the map room and were destroyed in the fire. Thomas sat around the work table in the weapons basement with Newt and Minho and Teresa. They hadn't found any scissors, so Thomas had to grab the sharpest knife he could find. This better be good, Minho said. Warning laced his voice, but his eyes showed some interest. Newt leaned forward, putting his elbows on the table, as if waiting for a magic trick. Get on with it, Greeny. Okay, Thomas was eager to do so, but was also scared to death it might end up being nothing. He handed the knife to Minho, then pointed at the wax paper. Start cutting rectangles, about the size of the maps. Newt and Teresa, you can help me grab the first ten or so maps from each section box. What is this, kitty craft time? Minho held up the knife and looked at it with disgust. Why don't you just tell us what the clunk we're doing this for? I'm done explaining, Thomas said, knowing that they had just to see what... I'm sorry, knowing they just had to see what he pictured in his mind. He stood to go rummage through the storage closet. It'll be easier to show you. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and we can go back to running around the maze like mice. Minho sighed, clearly irritated, then must muttered something under his breath. Teresa had stayed quiet for a while, but she spoke up inside Ter Thomas's head. I think I know what you're doing. Brilliant, actually. Thomas was startled, but he tried to, his best to cover it up. He knew he had to pretend that he didn't have voices in his head. The others would think he's a lunatic. Just come help me. He tried to say back, thinking each word separately, trying to visualize the message. Send it. But she didn't respond. Teresa, he said out loud, can you help me from can you help me a second? He nodded toward the closet. The two of them went into the dusty little room and opened up all the boxes, grabbing a stack of small stack of maps from each one. Returning to the table, Thomas found that Minho had cut twenty sheets already, making a messy pile to his right as he threw each new piece on top. Thomas sat down and grabbed a few. He held one of the papers up to the light. Saw how it shone through the mil with a milky glow. It was exactly what he needed. He grabbed a marker. All right, 
Everybody trace the last 10 days or so onto a piece of this stuff. Make sure you write the info on top so we can keep track of what's what. When we're done, I think we might see something. What? Minho began. Just bloody keep cutting, Newt ordered. I think I know where he's going with this. Thomas was relieved someone was finally getting it. They got to work, tracing from original maps to wax paper one by one, trying to keep it clean and correct while hurrying as fast as possible. Thomas used the side of a stray slab of wood to ma as a makeshift ruler, keeping his lines straight. Soon he'd copied five maps, then five more. The others kept the same pace, working feverishly. As Thomas drew, he started to feel a, tan a tickle of panic, a sick feeling that what they were doing was a complete waste of time. But Teresa, sitting next to him, was a study in concentration, her tongue sticking out of the corner of her mouth as she traced lines up and down, side to side. She seemed way more confident that they were definitely on to something. Box by box, section by section, they continued on. I've had enough, Newt finally announced, breaking the quiet. My fingers are bloody, burning like a mother. See if it's working. Thomas put his marker down, then flexed his fingers, hoping he'd been right about all this. Okay. Give me the last few days of each section. Make piles along the table, in order from section 1 to section 8. One here, he pointed at the end, to eight here, he pointed at the other end. Silently, they did as he asked, sorting out what they had, had traced until eight low stacks of wet wax paper lined the table. Jittery and nervous, Thomas picked up one page from each pile, making them, making sure they were all the same day, keeping them in order. He then laid one on top of the other, so each drawing of the maze matched the same day above it and below it, until he was looking at eight different sections of the maze at once. What he saw amazed him. Almost magically, like a picture coming into focus, an image developed. Teresa let out a small gasp. Lines crossed each other, up and down, so much that Thomas was so much that what Thomas held in his hands was looked like a checkered grid. But certain lines in the middle, lines that happened to appear more often than any other, made a slightly darker image than the rest. It was a subtle it was subtle, but it was, without a doubt, there. Sitting in the exact center of the page was the letter F. Chapter forty three. Thomas felt a rush of different emotions, relief that it worked, surprise, excitement, wonder at what it could lead to. Man, Minho said, summing up Thomas's feelings with one word. Could be a coincidence, Teresa said. Do more, quick. Thomas did, putting together eight pages of each day in order from section one to section eight. Each time, an obvious letter formed in the center of the crisscross mass of lines. After the F was an L, then an O, then an A, and a T. Then C, A, T. Look! Thomas said, pointing down at the line of stacks. They'd formed confused. But, okay. Look, Thomas said, pointing down the line of stacks they'd formed, confused, but happy to see that the letters were so obvious. It spells float. And then it spells cat. Float cat? Newt asked. Doesn't sound like a bloody rescue code to me. We need to just keep working, Thomas said. Another couple of combinations made them realize the second word was actually catch float, and catch. Definitely not a coincidence, Minho said. Definitely not, Thomas agreed. He couldn't wait to see more. Teresa gestured toward the storage closet. We need to go through all of them. All those boxes in there. Yeah, Thomas nodded. Let's get to it. We can't help, Minho said. All three of them looked at him. He returned their glares. At least not me and Thomas here. We need to get the runners out in the maze. What? Thomas asked. This is way more important. Maybe, Minho answered calmly, but we can't miss a day out there, not now. Thomas felt a rush of disappointment. Running the maze seemed like a complete waste of time compared to figuring out the code. Why, Minho? You said the pattern's basically been repeating itself for months. One more day won't mean a thing. Minho slammed his hand on against the table. That's bullcrap, Thomas! Of all days, this might be the most important time to get out there. Something might have changed. Something might have opened up. In fact, with the freaking walls not closing anymore, we should try your idea. Stay out there overnight and do some deep exploring. That piqued Thomas's interest. 
He had been wanting to do that. Conflicted, he asked, But what about the code? What about... Tommy, Newt said in a consoling voice. Minho's right. You shanks go out and get running. I'll round up some gladers we can trust and get working on this. Newt sounded more like a leader than ever before. Me too, Teresa agreed. I'll stay and help Newt. Thomas looked back at her. You sure? He was itching to figure out the code himself, but he decided Minnow and Newt were right. She smiled and folded her arms. If you're going to decipher a hidden code from a complex set of different mazes, I'm pretty sure you need a girl's brain running the show. Her grin turned into a smirk. If you say so, he folded his own arms, staring at her with a smile, suddenly not wanting to leave again. Good that, Minho nodded, turning to go. Everything's fine and dandy, come on. He started toward the door, but stopped when he realized Thomas wasn't behind him. Don't worry, Tommy, Newt said. Your girlfriend will be fine. Thomas felt a million thoughts go through his head in that moment. An itch to learn the code, embarrassment at what Newt thought of him, and Teresa, and Teresa, the intrigue of what they might find out in the maze, and fear. But he pushed it all aside. Without even saying goodbye, he finally followed Minho, and, and they went up the stairs. Thomas helped Minho gather the runners to give them the news and organize them for the big journey. He was surprised at how readily everyone agreed that it was time to do more in-depth exploring of the maze and stay out there overnight. Even though he was nervous and scared, he told Minho he could take one of the sections to himself, but the keeper refused. They had eight experienced runners to do that. Thomas was to go with him, which made Thomas so relieved that he was almost ashamed of himself. He and Minho packed their backpacks with more supplies than usual. There was no telling how long they would be out there. Despite his fear, Thomas couldn't help but being excited as well. Maybe this would be the day they find an exit. He and Minho were stretching their legs by the west door when Chuck found, walked over to say goodbye. I'd go with you, the boy said in a far too jovial voice, but I don't want to die a gruesome death. Thomas laughed, surprising himself. Thanks for the words of encouragement. Be careful, Chuck said, his tone quickly melting into gen genuine concern. I wish I could help you guys. Thomas was touched. He bet that if it really came down to it, Chuck would go out there if he were asked to. Thanks, Chuck. We'll definitely be careful. Minho grunted. Being careful hasn't gotten a sw squat. It's all or nothing now, baby. We better get going, Thomas said. Butterflies stormed in his gut. And he was just wanted to move, to quit thinking about it. After all, going out in the maze was no worse than staying in the glade with open doors. Though the thought didn't make him feel much better. Yeah, Minho responded evenly. Let's go. Well, Chuck said, looking down at his feet before returning to get his gaze to Thomas. Good luck. If your girlfriend gets lonely for you, I'll give her some lovin'. Thomas rolled his eyes. She's not my girlfriend, Chuck face. Wow, Chuck said. You're already using D Albie's dirty words. He was obviously trying hard to pretend he wasn't scared of all the recent developments, but his eyes revealed the truth. Seriously, good luck. Thanks. That means a lot. Minho answered with his own eye roll. See ya, Shank. Yeah, see ya, Chuck muttered, then turned to walk away. Thomas felt a ping of sadness. It was possible he, was never, he would never see Chuck or Teresa or any of them again. A sudden urge gripped him. Don't forget my promise, he yelled. I'll get you home. Chuck turned and gave him a thumbs up. His eyes glimmered with tears. Thomas flipped up, the double, flipped up double thumbs, then he and Minho pulled on their backpacks and entered the maze. Chapter 44 Thomas and Minho didn't stop until they were halfway to the last dead end of Section 8. They made good time. Thomas was glad for his wristwatch, with the skies being gray, because it quickly became obvious that the walls hadn't moved from the day before. Everything was exactly the same. There was no need for map making or taking notes. Their only task was to get to the end and start making their way back, searching for things they hadn't noticed. Anything. Sorry. Searching for things they previously noticed. Anything. Minho allowed a 20 minute break for them, then they were back at it. They were silent as they ran. Minho had taught Thomas that speaking only wasted energy, so he concentrated on his pace and his breaths. Regular, even. In, out. In, out. Deeper and deeper into the maze they went. 
with only the thoughts and the seconds sounds of their feet thumping against the hard stone floor. In the third hour, Teresa surprised him, speaking in his mind from the back of the glade. We're making progress. We found a couple, word, couple more words already, but none of it makes sense yet. Thomas's first instinct was to ignore her, to deny once again that someone had the ability to enter his mind, invade his privacy. But he wanted to talk to her. Can you hear me? he asked, picturing the words in his mind, mentally throwing them out in some way he could never have explained. Concentrating, he said it again. Can you hear me? Yes, she replied, really clearly the second time he said it. Thomas was shocked. So shocked he almost quit running. It had worked. Wonder why we can do this, he called out with his, with his mind. The mental effort of speaking to her was already straining. He felt a headache forming like a bulge in his brain. Maybe we were lovers, Teresa said. Thomas tripped and crashed to the ground, smiling sheepishly at Minho, who had turned to look without slowing. Thomas got back up and caught up to him. What? he finally asked. He sensed a laugh from her, a watery image full of color. This is so bizarre, she said. It's like you're a stranger, but I know you're not. Thomas felt a pleasant chill, even though he was swearing, sweating. Sorry to break it to you, but we are strangers. I just met you, remember? Don't be stupid, Tom. I think someone's altered our brains, put something in there so we could do this telepathy thing. Before we came here. Which makes me think we already knew each other. It was something he wondered about, and he thought she was probably right. Hoped it, anyway. He was really starting to like her. Brains altered, he asked? How? I don't know. Some memory I can't quite grasp. I think we did something big. Thomas thought about how he had always felt a connection to her, ever since she arrived in the glade. He wanted to dig a little more and see what she said. What are you talking about? Wish I knew. I'm just trying to bounce ideas off you to see if it sparks anything in your mind. Thomas thought about what Galley, Ben, and Albie had said about him. Their suspicions that he was he was against them somehow was someone was someone not to trust. He thought about what Teresa said to him too, the very first time that he and she somehow had done all this to them. The code has to mean something, she added. And the thing I wrote on my arm, wicked is good. Maybe it won't matter, he answered. Maybe we'll find an exit. We'll never know. You never know. Thomas squeezed his eyes shut for a few seconds as he ran, trying to concentrate. A pocket of air seemed to float in his chest every time they spoke, a swelling of that half annoyed, half thrilled him. His eyes popped back open when he realized that she could maybe read his thoughts even when he wasn't trying to communicate. He waited for a response, but none came. You still there? he asked. Yeah, but this always gives me a headache. Thomas was relieved to hear he wasn't the only one. My head hurts, too. Okay, she said. See you later. No, wait! He didn't want her to leave. She was helping the time pass, making the running easier somehow. Bye, Tom. I'll let you know if we figure anything out. Teresa, what about the thing you wrote on your arm? Several seconds passed. No reply. Teresa? She was gone. Thomas felt as if that bubble of air in his chest had burst, releasing toxins in his body. His stomach hurt, and the thought of running the rest of the day suddenly depressed him. In some ways, he wanted to tell Minnow about how he and Teresa could talk, to share what was happening before it made his brain explode. But he didn't dare. Throwing telepathy into this whole situation didn't seem like the grandest of ideas. Everything was weird enough already. Thomas put his head down and drew in a long, deep breath. He would just keep his mouth shut and run. Two breaks later, Minho slowed to a walk, as they headed down a long corridor that ended at a wall. He stopped and took a seat against the dead end. The ivy was especially thick here. It made the world seem green and lush, hiding the hard, impenetrable stone. Thomas joined him on the ground, and they attacked the modest lunch of sandwiches and sliced fruit. This is it, Minho said, after his second bite. We've already run through the whole section. Surprise, surprise, no exits. Thomas already knew this, but hearing, hearing it made his heart sink even lower. Without another word, he made him for from him, sorry, from himself or Minho, he finished his food and readied himself to explore, to look for you, who know what. 
Wow, to look for who knew what. For the next few hours, he and Minho scouted the ground, felt along the walls, climbed up the ivy in random spots. They found nothing. Thomas grew more and more discouraged. The only thing interesting was another one of those cold signs, odd signs, that read World in Catastrophe Kill Zone Experiment Department. Minho didn't even give it a second glance. They had another meal and searched some more. They found nothing, and Thomas was beginning to get ready for the inevitable, that there was nothing to find. When wall closing time rolled around, he started looking for signs of grievers, was struck by an icy hesitation in every corner. He and Minho already had knives cl clasped firmly in both hands, but nothing showed up until almost midnight. Minho spotted a griever disappearing around a corner ahead of them, and it didn't come back. Thirty minutes later, Thomas saw one do the exact same. An hour after that, a griever came charging through the maze right past them, not even pausing. Thomas almost collapsed from the sudden rush of terror. He and Minho continued on. I think they're playing with us, Minho said a while later. Thomas realized he had given up on searching the walls and was just heading back to the glade in a depressed walk. From the looks of it, Minho felt the same way. What do you mean? The keeper sighed. I think the creators wanted us to know there's no way out. The walls aren't even moving anymore. It's like this has all just been some stupid game and it's time to end. And they want us to go back and tell the other gladers. How much you want to bet when we get back to find out the griever took one of them just like last night? I think Galley was right. They're going to keep killing us. Thomas didn't respond felt the truth of what Minho had said. Any hope he felt earlier when they set out had crashed a long time ago. Let's just go home, Minho said, his voice weary. Thomas hated to admit defeat, but he nodded in agreement. The code seemed like their only hope now, and he, would, and he resolved to focus on that. He and Minho made their way silently back to the glade. They didn't see another griever the whole way. Chapter 45 By Thomas's watch, it was mid-morning when he and Minho stepped through the west door back into the glade. Thomas was so tired, he wanted to lay down right there and take a nap. They had been in the maze for roughly 24 hours. Surprisingly, despite the dead light and everything falling apart, the day in the glade appeared to be proceeding business as usual. Farming, gardening, cleaning. It didn't take long for some of the boys to notice them standing there. Newt was notified, and he came running. You're the first to come back, he said as he walked up to them. What happened? The child, childlike look of hope on his face broke Thomas's heart. He obviously thought they had found something important. Tell me you've got good news. Minho's eyes were dead, staring at a spot somewhere in the gray distance. Nothing, he said. The maze is a big freaking joke. Newt looked at Thomas, confused. What's he talking about? He's just discouraged, Thomas said with a weary shrug. We didn't find anything different. The walls haven't moved. No exits. Nothing. Did the grievers come last night? Newt paused, darkness passing over his face. Finally, he nodded. Yeah, they took Adam. Thomas didn't know the name and felt guilty for feeling nothing. Just one person, again. Maybe, or he thought, maybe Galley was right. Run out of the frame. Newt was about to say something else when Minho freaked out, startling Thomas. I'm sick of this, Minho spat on the ivy, veins popping out of his neck. I'm sick of it. It's over. It's all over. He took off his backpack and threw it on the ground. There's no exit. Never was, never will be. We're all shucked. Thomas watched, his throat dry, as Minho stomped off toward the homestead. It worried him. If Minho gave up, then we're all big, they were all in big trouble. Newt didn't say a word. He left Thomas standing there, now in his own days. Despair hung in the air like the smoke from the map room, thick and acrid. The other runners returned within the hour, and from what Thomas heard, none of them found anything, and they had obviously given up as well. Glum faces were everywhere throughout the glade, and most of the workers had abandoned their daily jobs. Thomas knew that the code of the maze was their only hope now. It had to reveal something. It had to. And after aimlessly wandering the glade to hear the other runner's stories, he snapped out of his funk. Teresa? He said in his mind, closing his eyes as if 
That would do the trick. Where are you? Did you figure anything out? After a long pause, he almost gave up, thinking it didn't work. Huh? Tom, did you say something? Yeah, he said, excited to make contact again. Can you hear me? Am I doing this thing right? Sometimes it's choppy, but it's working. Kind of freaky, huh? Thomas thought about that. Actually, he was sort of getting used to it. It's not so bad. Are you guys still in the basement? I saw Newt, but then he disappeared again. Still here. Newt had three or four gladers help us trace the maps. I think we have the code all figured out. Thomas's heart leaped into his throat. Serious? Get down here. I'm coming. He was already moving as, she, as he said it, somehow not feeling exhausted anymore. Newt let him in. Minho still hasn't shown up, he said as he walked down the stairs to the basement. Sometimes he turns into a bug and hothead. Thomas was surprised Minho was wasting time sulking, especially with the code possibilities. He pushed the thought aside as he entered the room. Several gladers he didn't know were gathered around the table, standing. They all looked exhausted, their eyes sunken. Piles of maps lay scattered all, all over the place, including the floor. It looked as if a tornado had touched down right in the middle of the room. Teresa was leaning against a stack of shelves, reading a single sheet of paper. She glanced up when he entered, but then returned her gaze to whatever it is she held. This saddened him a little. He hoped she'd be happy to see him, but then he felt really stupid for even having the thought. She was obviously busy trying to figure out the code. You have to see this, Teresa said to him just as Newt dismissed his helpers. They clomped up the wooden stairs, a couple of them grumbling about doing all that work for nothing. Thomas started, for a brief moment worried about worried that Newt could tell what was going on. Don't talk in my head while Newt's around. I don't want him knowing our gift. Come check this out, she said aloud, barely hiding the smirk that flashed across her face. I'll get down on my knees and, clit and kiss your bloody feet if you can figure it out, Newt said. Thomas walked over to Teresa, eager to see what they had come up with. She held out the paper, eyebrows raised. No doubt this is right, she said. Just don't have a clue what it means. Thomas took the paper and scanned it quickly. They were numbered circles running down the left side, one to six. Next to each one was a word written in big blocky letters. Float, catch, bleed, death, stiff, push. That was it. Six words. Disappointment washed over Thomas. He had been sure the purpose of the code would be obvious once they had figured it out. He looked up at Teresa with a sunken heart. That's all? Are you sure they're in the right order? She took the paper back from him. The maze has been repeating those words for months. We finally quit when that became clear. Each time after the word push, it goes a full week without showing any letter at all, and then starts over all again with float. So we figured that's the first word, and that's the order. Thomas folded his arms and leaned against the shelves next to Teresa. Without thinking about it, he had memorized the six words, welded them to his mind. Float, catch, bleed, death, stiff, push. That didn't sound good. Cheerful, don't you think? Newt said, mirroring, mirroring his thoughts exactly. Yeah, Thomas replied with a frustrated groan. We need to get Minho down here. Maybe he knows something we don't. If we just had more clues... He froze, hit by a dizzy spell. He would have fallen over to the floor if it hadn't been for the shelves to lean on. An idea just occurred to him. A horrible, terrible, awful idea. The worst idea in the history of horrible, terrible, awful ideas. But instinct told him he was right, that it was something he had to do. Tommy? Newt asked, stepping closer with a look of concern, creasing his forehead. What's wrong with you? Your face just went white as a ghost. Thomas shook his head, composing himself. Oh, nothing, sorry. My eyes are hurting. I think I need some sleep. He rubbed his temples for effect. Are you okay? Teresa asked in his mind. He looked to see if she was as worried as Newt, which made him feel, which made him feel good. Yeah, seriously, I'm tired. I just need some rest. Well, Newt said, reaching out to squeeze Thomas's shoulder. You spent all bloody night out in the maze. Go take a nap. Thomas looked at Teresa, then at Newt. He wanted to share his idea, but declined, decided against it. Instead, he just nodded and headed for the stairs. 
All the same, Thomas now had a plan. As bad as it was, he had a plan. They needed more clues about the code. They needed memories. So he was going to get stung by a griever, go through the changing, on purpose. Chapter 46 Thomas refused to talk to anyone the rest of the day. Teresa tried it several times, but he kept telling her he didn't feel good, that he just wanted to be left alone asleep in a spot behind the forest, maybe spend some time thinking, try to discover a hidden secret within his mind that would help him, help them know what to do. But in truth, he was psyching himself up for what he had planned for that evening, convincing himself it was the right thing to do, the only thing to do. Plus, he was absolutely terrified that he didn't want the others to notice. Eventually, when his watch showed that the evening had arrived, he went to the homestead with everyone else. He barely noticed he had been hungry until he started eating fry pans, hastily prepared meals of biscuits and tomato soup. Then it was time for another sleepless night. The builders had boarded up the gaping holes left by the monsters who had carried off Galley and Adam. The end result looked to Thomas like an army of drunk guys had done the work. But it was solid enough. Newton Alby, who finally felt well enough to walk around again, his head heavily bandaged, insisted on a plan for everyone to rotate where they slept each night. Thomas ended up in a large living room on the bottom floor of the homestead with the same people he'd slept with two nights before. Silence settled over the room quickly, though he didn't know if it was because people were actually asleep or just scared, quietly hoping against hope the grievers didn't come again. Unlike two nights ago, Teresa was allowed to stay in the building with the rest of the gladers. She was near him, curled up in two blankets. Somehow he could sense that she was sleeping. Actually sleeping. Thomas certainly couldn't sleep, even though he knew his body needed it desperately. He tried. He tried so hard to close, keep his eyes closed, force, him, force himself to relax. But he had no luck. The night dragged on, the heavy sense of anticipation like a weight on his chest. Then, just as they all had expected, came the mechanical haunted sounds of the grievers outside. The time had come. Everyone crowded together against the wall furthest from the windows, doing their best to keep quiet. Thomas huddled in a corner next to Teresa, hugging his knees, staring at the window. The reality of the dreadful decision he'd made earlier squeezed his heart like a crushing fist. But he knew that everything might depend on it. The tension in the room rose at a steady pace. The gladers were quiet. Not a soul moved. A distant scraping of metal against wood echoed through the house. It sounded to Thomas like a griever was climbing on the back side of the homestead, opposite where they were. More noises joined in a few seconds later, coming from all directions, the closest right outside their own window. The air in the room seemed to freeze like solid ice, and Thomas pressed his fists against his eyes, the anticipation of the, the attack killing him. A booming explosion of rip... Ripping wood and broken glass thundered from somewhere upstairs, shaking the whole house. Thomas went numb as several screams erupted, followed by the pounding of fleeing footsteps. Loud creaks and groans announced a whole horde of gladers running, toward, to the running to the first floor. "'It's got Dave!' someone yelled, the voice high-pitched with terror. No one in Thomas's room moved a muscle. He knew each of them was probably feeling guilty about their relief, that at least it wasn't them. But maybe they were safe for one more night. Two nights in a row, only one boy had been taken. And people had started to believe what Galley had said was true. Thomas jumped in as a terrible crash sounded right outside the door, and accompanied by screams and the splintering of wood, like some iron-jawed monster was eating the entire stairwell. A second later came another explosion of ripping wood, the front door. The griever had come right through the house and was now leaving. An explosion of fear ripped through Thomas. It was now or never. He jumped up and ran to the door of the room, yanking it open. He heard Newt yell, but he ignored him and ran down the hallway, sidestepping and jumping over hundreds of splintered pieces of wood. He could see that where the front door had been now stood a jagged hole leading out of the, into the gray night. He headed straight for it, running, and ran out into the glade. Tom! Teresa screamed inside his head. What are you doing? He ignored her. He just kept running. The griever holding Dave, a kid Thomas had never spoken to, was rolling along on his spikes toward the west door, churning and whirring. The other grievers had already gathered in the courtyard and followed their companion toward the maze. Without hesitating, knowing the others would think he was trying to commit suicide, 
Thomas sprinted in their direction until he found himself in the middle of the pack of the creatures. Having been taken by surprise, the Grievers hesitated. Thomas jumped on the one holding Dave, trying to jerk the kid free, hoping the creature would retaliate. Teresa screamed inside his mind. Teresa's scream in his mind was so loud, it felt as a dagger, as if a dagger had been driven through his skull. Three of the Grievers swarmed him all at once, their long pinchers and claspers and needles flying in all directions. Thomas flailed his arms and legs, knocking away the horrible metallic arms as he kicked at the pulsating blubber of the Grievers' bodies. He only wanted to be stung, not taken like Dave. Their relentless attack intensified, and Thomas felt pain erupt for over every inch of his body. Needle pricks told him he had succeeded. Screaming, he kicked and pushed and thrashed, throwing his body into a roll, trying to get away from them. Struggling, bursting with adrenaline, he finally found an open spot to get, to his, get his feet under him and ran with all his power. As soon as he escaped the immediate reach of the Grievers' instrument, Grievers' instruments, they gave up and retreated, disappearing into the maze. Thomas collapsed to the ground, groaning with pain. Newt was on him in a second, followed immediately by Chuck, Teresa, and several others. Newt grabbed him by the shoulders and lifted him up, gripping him under the arms. Get his legs, he yelled. Thomas felt the world swimming around him, felt delirious, nauseated. Someone, he couldn't tell who, obeyed Newt's orders. He was being carried across the courtyard through the front door of the homestead, down the shattered hall, into a room, placed on a couch. The world continued to twist and pitch. What were you doing? Newt yelled in his face. How could you be so bloody stupid? Thomas had to speak before he faded into blackness. No, Newt, you don't understand. Shut up, Newt shouted. Don't waste your energy. Thomas felt someone examining his arms and legs, ripping his clothes away from his body, checking for damage. He heard Chuck's voice, couldn't help feeling relief that his friend was okay. A medjack said something about him being stung a dozens of times. Teresa was by his feet, squeezing his right ankle with her hand. Why, Tom? Why would you do that? Because he didn't have the strength to concentrate. Newt yelled for the grief serum. A minute later, Thomas felt a pinprick on his arm. Warmth spread from that point throughout his body, calming him lessening the pain, but the world still seemed to be collapsing in on itself, and he knew it would all be gone from him within just a few seconds. The room spun, colors morphing into each other, churning faster and faster. It took all his effort, but he said one last thing before the darkness took him for good. Don't worry, he whispered, hoping they could hear him. I did it on purpose. 47. Thomas had no concept of time as he went through the changing. It started much like his first memory of the box, dark and cold, but this time he had no sensation of anything touching his feet or body. He floated in emptiness, stared into a void of black. He saw nothing, heard nothing, and smelled nothing. It was as if someone had stolen his five senses, leaving him in a vacuum. Time stretched on and on. Fear turned into curiosity, which turned into boredom. Finally, after an interminable wait, things began to change. A distant wind picked up, unfelt but heard. Then a swirling mist of whiteness appeared far off in the distance, a spinning tornado of smoke that formed a long tunnel, stretching out until he could see neither the top nor the bottom of the white whirlwind. He felt the gales then, sucking into the cyclone so that it blew past him from behind, ripping at his clothes and hair like shredded flags caught in a storm. The tower of thick mist began to move all around him, or he was moving toward it, he couldn't tell, increasing his speed at an alarming rate. Where seconds before he had been able to see the distinct form of the funnel, he now could only see a flat expanse of white. And then it consumed him, he felt his mind taken by the mist, felt memories flood into his thoughts. Everything else turned into pain. Chapter 48 Thomas? The voice was distant, distant, warbled like an echo in a long tunnel. Thomas, can you hear me? He didn't want to answer. His mind had shut down when it could no longer take the pain. He feared it would all return if he allowed himself back into consciousness. He sensed light on the other side of his eyelids. 
but knew it would be unbearable to open them. He did nothing. Thomas, it's Chuck. Are you okay? Please don't die, dude. Everything came crashing back into his mind. The glade, the grievers, the stinging needles, the changing memories. The maze couldn't be solved. Their only way out was something they never expected. Something terrifying. He was crushed with despair. Groaning, he forced his eyes open, squinting at first. Chuck's pudgy face was there, staring with frightened eyes, but then lit up and a smile spread across his face. Despite it all, despite the terrible crappiness of it all, Chuck smiled. He's awake, the boy yelled to no one in particular. Thomas is awake. The booming sound of his, vo his voice made... Sorry. The booming sound of his voice made Thomas wince. He shut his eyes again. Chuck, do you have to scream? I don't feel so good. Sorry, I'm just glad you're alive. You're lucky I don't give you a big old kiss. Please don't do that, Chuck. Thomas opened his eyes again and forced himself to sit up in the bed in which he lay, pushing his back against the wall and stretching out his legs. Soreness ate at his joints and muscles. How long did it take? he asked. Three days, Chuck answered. We put you in the slammer at night to keep you safe. Brought you back here during the days. Thought you were dead for sure about 30 times since you started. But check you out. You look brand new. Thomas could only imagine how not great he looked. Did the grievers come? Chuck's jubilation visibly crashed to the ground as his eyes sank down to the floor. Yeah, they got Zart and a couple others. One a night. Minnow and the runners have scoured the maze trying to find an exit or something to, for that stupid code you guys came up with, but nothing. Why do you think the Grievers are only taking one shank at a time? Thomas's stomach turned sour. He knew the exact answer to that question, and some others now. Enough to know that someti sometimes knowing sucked. Get Newt and Alby, he finally said in answer. Tell them we need to have a gathering as soon as possible. Serious? Thomas let out a sigh. Chuck, I just went through the changing. Do you think I'm serious? Without a word, Chuck jumped up and ran out of the room, his calls for Newt fading the farther he went. Thomas closed his eyes and rested his head against the wall. Then he called out to her with his mind. Teresa? She didn't answer at first. But then her voice popped into his thought as clearly as if she were sitting next to him. That was really stupid, Tom. Really, really stupid. Had to do it, he answered. I pretty much hated you the last couple days. You should have seen yourself. Your skin, your veins. You hated me? He was thrilled she cared so much about him. She paused. That's just my way of saying I would have killed you if you died. Thomas felt a burst of warmth in his chest, reaching reached up and actually touched it, surprised at himself. Well, thanks, I guess. So how much do you remember? He paused. Enough. What you said about the two of us and what we did to them. It was true? We did some bad things, Teresa. He sensed frustration from her, like she had had a million questions and no idea where to start. Did you learn anything to help us get out of here, she asked, as if she didn't want to know what part she had in all this. A purpose for the code? Thomas paused, not really wanting to talk about it yet, not before he gathered his thoughts. Their only chance for escape might be a death wish. Maybe, he finally said, but it wouldn't be easy. We need a gathering. I'll ask for you to be there. I don't have the energy to say it all twice. Neither one of them said anything for a while, a sense of hopelessness wafting between their minds. Teresa? Yeah. The maze can't be solved. She paused for a long time before answering. I think we all know that now. Thomas hated the pain in her voice. He could feel it in his mind. Don't worry. The Creator's meant for us to escape, though. I have a plan. He wanted her to give her some hope, no matter how scarce. Oh, really? Yeah, it's terrible, and some of us might die. Sound promising? Big time. What is it? We have to... Before he could finish, Newt walked into the room, cutting him off. I'll tell you later, Thomas quickly finished. Hurry, she said, then was gone. Newt had walked over to the bed and sat down next to him. Tommy, you barely look sick. Thomas nodded. I feel a little queasy, but other than that, I'm fine. Thought it'd be a lot worse. Newt shook his head, his face a mixture of anger and awe. What you did was half brave and half bloody stupid. Seems like you're pretty good at that. He paused and shook his head. I know why you did it. 
What memories came back? Anything that'll help? We need to have a gathering, Thomas said, shifting his legs to get more comfortable. Surprisingly, he didn't feel much pain, just wooziness. Before I start forgetting some of this stuff. Yeah, Chuck told me. We'll do it. But why? What did you figure out? It's a test, Newt. The whole thing is a test. Newt nodded. Like an experiment? Thomas shook his head. No, you don't get it. They're weeding us out, seeing if we'll give up, finding the best of us. Throwing variables at us, trying to make us quit. Testing our ability to hope and fight. Sending Teresa here and shutting down everything was only the last part. One more final analysis. Now it's time for the last test, to escape. Newt's brow crinkled in confusion. What do you mean? You know a way out? Yeah. Call the gathering. Now. Chapter 49 An hour later, Thomas sat in front of the keepers for the gathering, just like he had a week or two before. They hadn't let Teresa in, which ticked him off just as much as it did her. Newton Minho trusted her now, but the others still had their doubts. All right, Greeny, Albie said, looking much better as he sat in the middle of the semicircle of chairs next to Newt. The other chairs were all occupied except for two, a stark reminder that Zart and Galley had been taken by the Grievers. Forget all the beat around the bush, clunk. Start talking. Thomas, still a little queasy from the changing, forced himself to take a second and gain his composure. He had a lot to say, but wanted to be sure it came out sounding as non-stupid as possible. It's a long story, he began. We don't have time to go through it all, but I'll tell you the gist of it. When I went through the changing, I saw flashes of images, hundreds of them, like a slideshow and fast forward. A lot came back to me, but only some of it clear enough to talk about. Other stuff has faded or is fading. He paused, gathering his thoughts one last time. But I remember enough. The creators are testing us. The maze was never meant to be solved. It's all been a trial. They want the winners, or survivors, to do something important. He trailed off, already confused at what order he should tell things in. What? Newt asked. Let me start over, Thomas said, rubbing his eyes. Every single one of us were taken when we were really young. I don't remember how or why, just glimpses of and feelings that things had changed in the world, that something really bad happened. I have no idea why. The creators stole us, and I think they feel justified in doing it. Somehow they figured out that we have above average intelligence, and that's why they chose us. I don't know. Most of this is sketchy and doesn't matter that much anyway. I can't remember anything about my family or what happened to them, but after we were taken... We spent the next few years learning in special schools, living somewhat normal lives until they were finally able to finance and build the maze. All our names were just stupid nicknames they made up, like Albie for Albert Einstein, Newt for Isaac Newton, and me, Thomas, as in Edison. Albie looked like he'd been slapped in the face. Our names? These ain't even our real names? Thomas shook his head. As far as I can tell, we probably never know our, what our names were. What are you saying, Frypan asked, that we're freaking orphans raised by scientists? Yes, Thomas said, hoping his expression didn't give away just how depressed he felt. Supposedly, we're really smart and they're studying every move we make, analyzing us. Seeing who'd give up and who wouldn't. Seeing who'd survive it all. No wonder we'd have so many beetle blade spies running around this place. Plus, some of us had things altered in our brains. I believe this clunk as much as I believe fry pan's food is good for you, Winston grumbled, looking tired and, and indifferent. Why would I make this up? Thomas said, his voice rising. He'd gotten stung on purpose to remember these things. Better yet, what do you think is the explanation? That we live on an alien planet? Just keep talking, Albie said. But I don't get why none of us remember this stuff. I've been through the changing, but everything I saw was... He looked around quickly, like he had just said something he shouldn't have. I didn't learn nothing. I'll tell you in a minute why I think I learned more than the others, Thomas said, dreading that part of the story. Should I keep going or not? Talk, Newt said. Thomas sucked in a big breath, as if he were about to start a race. Okay, somehow they wiped our memories, not just our childhood, but all the stuff leading up to entering the maze. They put us in the box and sent us up here, a big group to start, then one a month over the last two years. But why? What's the, what's the bloody point? 
Thomas held up a hand for silence. I'm getting there. Like I said, they wanted to test us to see how we'd react to what they call the variables and to a problem that has no solution. See if we could work together, build a community even. Everything was provided for us and the problem was laid out as one of the most common puzzles known to civilization, a maze. All this adding up to making us think that there had to be a solution, just encouraging us to work all the harder while at the same time magnifying our discouragement and not finding one. He paused to look around, making sure they were all listening. What I'm saying is there is no solution. Chatter broke out, questions overlapping each other. Thomas held his hands up again, wishing he could just zap his thoughts into everyone's brain. See, your reaction proves my point. Most people would have given up by now, but I think we're different. We couldn't accept a problem that couldn't be solved, especially when it's something as simple as a maze. And we've kept fighting no matter how hopeless it's gotten. Thomas realized his voice had steadily risen as he spoke, and he felt the heat in his face. Whatever the reason, it makes me sick. All of this, the grievers, the walls moving, the cliff, they're just elements of a stupid test. We're being used and manipulated. The creators wanted to keep our minds working towards a solution that was never there. Same thing goes for Teresa being sent here, her being used to trigger the ending, whatever that means. This place is shut down. Gray skies, on and on and on. They're throwing crazy things at us to see our response, to test our will. See if, they will turn, if we'll turn on each other. In the end, they want the survivors for something important. Frypan stood up. And killing people? That's a nice little part of their plan. Thomas felt for a moment of fear, worried that the keepers might take out their anger on him for knowing so much. And it was only about to get worse. Yes, Frypan. Killing people. The only reason the Grievers are doing it one by one is so we don't all die before it ends the way it's supposed to. Survival of the fittest. Only the best of us will escape. Frypan kicked his chair. Well, you better start talking about this magical escape then. He will, Newt said quietly. Shut up and listen. Minho, who had been mostly silent the whole time, cleared his throat. Something tells me I'm not going to like what I'm about to hear. Probably not, Thomas said. He closed his eyes for a second and folded his arms. The next few minutes were going to be crucial. The creators want the best of us for whatever it is they have planned, but we have to earn it. The room felt completely silent, every eye on him. The code. The code, Frypan repeated, his voice lining up with a trace of hope. What about it? Thomas looked at him, paused for effect. It was hidden in the wall movements of the maze for a reason. I should know. I was there when the creators did it. Chapter 50 For a long moment, no one said anything, and all Thomas saw were blank faces. He felt the sweat beating on his forehead, slicking his hands. He was terrified to keep going. Newt looked completely baffled and finally broke the silence. What are you talking about? Well, first there's something I have to share about me and Teresa. There's a reason Galli accused me of so much stuff, and why everyone who's gone through why everyone who's gone through the changing recognizes me. He expected questions, an eruption of voices, but the room was dead silent. Teresa and I are different, he continued. We're a part of the maze trials for the, from the beginning, but against our will, I swear. Minna was the one to speak up now. Thomas, what are you talking about? Teresa and I were used by the creators. If you had our full, your full memories back, you'd probably want to kill us. But I had to tell you this myself to show you we can be trusted now. So you'll believe me when I tell you the only way we can get out of here. Thomas quickly scanned the faces of the keepers, wondering one last time if he should say it, if they would understand. But he knew he had to. He had to. Thomas took a deep breath, then said it. Teresa and I helped design the maze. We helped create this whole thing. Everyone seemed too stunned to respond. Blank faces stared back at him every once again. Thomas figured they either didn't understand or didn't believe him. What's that supposed to mean? Newt finally asked. You're a bloody 16-year-old. How could you have created the maze? Thomas couldn't help doubting himself a little bit, but he knew what he had remembered. As crazy as it was, he knew the truth. We were smart. 
and I think we might be part of the variables. But most importantly, Teresa and I have a gift that makes us valuable as they designed and built this place. He stopped, knowing it must all sound absurd. Speak, Newt yelled. Spit it out. We're telepathic. We can talk to each other in our freaking heads. Saying it out loud almost made him feel ashamed, as if he admitted, admitted he was a thief. Newt blinked in surprise. Someone coughed. But listen to me, Thomas continued, in a hurry to defend himself. They forced us to help. I don't know how or why, but they did. He paused. Maybe it was to see if we could gain your trust despite having a part, been a part of them. Maybe we were meant all along to be the ones to reveal how to escape. Whatever the reason, with your maps, we figured out the code and we need to use it now. Thomas looked around and surprisingly, astonishingly, no one seemed to be angry. Most of the gladers continued to stare blankly at him or shook their heads in wonder and disbelief. And for some reason, Minho was smiling. It's true, and I'm sorry, Thomas continued, but I can, I can tell you this. I'm in the same boat with you now. Teresa and I were sent here just like everyone else, and we can die just as easily. But the creators have seen enough. It's time for the final test. I guess I needed the changing to add the final pieces of the puzzle. Anyway, I wanted you to know the truth, to know there's a chance we can do this. Newt shook his head back and forth, staring at the ground. Then he looked up, took in the other keepers. The creators, those shanks did this to us, Tommy, or not Tommy and Teresa. The creators, and they'll be sorry. Whatever, Minnow said. Who gives a clunk about all that? Just get on with the escape already. A lump formed in Thomas's throat. He was so relieved he couldn't he almost couldn't speak. He'd been sure they'd put him under major heat for this confession, if not throw him off the cliff. The rest of what he had to say almost seemed easy now. There's a computer station in a place we'd never looked before. The code will open a door for us to get out of the maze. It also shuts down the grievers so they can't follow us, if we can just survive long enough to get to that point. A place we've never looked before? Albie asked. What do you think we've been doing for two years? Trust me, you've never been to this point. Newt st Minho stood up. Well, where is it? It's almost suicide, Thomas said, knowing he was putting off the answer. The grievers will come after us whenever we try to do it. All of them. The final test. He wanted to make sure they understood the stakes. The odds of everyone surviving were slim. So where is it? Newt asked, leaning forward in his chair. Over the cliff, Thomas answered. We have to go through the griever hole.